Hi everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you've been watching my videos, you know that they are for use by students who are enrolled in my Biology 2420 or Microbiology for the Health Sciences class. Um, if you're in my class, please hit like and subscribe so that as new videos are added, you are notified. Uh, if you're not in my class and you want, you find these videos helpful, and then you can hit like and subscribe and you'll be notified as well. You can also provide me some feedback and let me know if these videos are helpful or not. Um, anyway, so uh, um, finally, if you're not enrolled in my class but you're using these videos, please be aware that your instructor may go into some additional detail in some areas. Make sure you learn the material that's required for your class. This is for my students, but should be of general use for most people taking a sophomore level microbiology class. Now, today's lecture is going to be over microscopy. Uh, microscopy is uh, the technique or the technology to observe those things which are too small to be seen with the naked eye. So literally, it's, it's taking things that we cannot see, magnifying them using some kind of optical system so that we can visualize objects that are very, very tiny. The term micro means tiny and scope means to see or visualize and so it means to see tiny things and now the instrument that we utilize is called a microscope and we're going to be doing a lot of this information for both lecture and lab um, and lab will be using the microscope we'll be observing microorganisms we'll be um, calibrating our um, micrometers which is a little tool used to measure the size of the microorganisms and things so we'll be doing all of that in lab, but in order to do that, there's some definitions and some information that we need to cover here so that you guys can understand and be prepared for the terminology used in the laboratory. The tool that we use is the microscope, and there's different types of microscope, there's different types of microscopy that we can talk about. First and foremost, a microscope is not always necessary to see some of the organisms that we're going to look at. There are some organisms in, that we study in microbiology using other techniques in microbiology that are somewhat visible to the naked eye. Nonetheless, um, many of the ones that we're gonna use or we're gonna observe are, require the microscope to see them. So, so no, a microscope is not always necessary to, to study some of the organisms in microbiology. One other thing I think is important to note Increasing magnification and continuing to increase magnification does not always allow you to see things better, so to speak. Um, there are times where as we increase the magnification, the resolution or the ability to focus or see detail just doesn't work. It's almost as if, you know, if you move your fingers away from your face to read your fingerprints, well, if you put them too close, you're increasing the magnification, so to speak. It looks a lot bigger but it's so blurry you cannot see detail. So one of, the, one of the key techniques in microbiology and microscopy is finding the correct magnification to see the greatest amount of detail of whatever it is that you're looking at. If you're trying to see a whole organism like a paramecium, you might wanna use a lower or middle magnification. If you wanna see some details in it, you might wanna increase the magnification using different techniques and different objectives. We'll talk about all of this as we go on. So, so, number one, you need to know the definition of microscopy. And number two, you need to know that um, you don't always have to increase magnification or even use a microscope to get the greatest amount of detail for some of the things we're going to see. Now, um, when it comes to microscopy, one of the things that, that we need to go over really quick is the units of measurement. So, we're gonna talk about these units of measurement and some of y'all may know this, some of you may not. So, when we talk about a meter, the abbreviation is M, and you know, a meter is a meter. I'm gonna show you a meter stick. It's this size, right? It's a little more than three feet, it's about 39 inches, or about as high as a doorknob, okay? So, Everyone kind of knows what a meter is. It's about three feet or close to a yard. Now, when we talk about a centimeter, centi refers to the term hundred, like century. A centimeter, abbreviated as cm, is one one hundredth of a meter. 
and it is abbreviated as 0 0.01. Remember, after the decimal, it's tens, and then hundreds, and then thousands, and ten thousands, and so on. So it's 0 0.01, or sometimes it's abbreviated as 10 to the minus 2. That tells you how many digits are behind the decimal point. The next size that we will talk about sometimes is a millimeter, abbreviated as MM. A millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter, and it's abbreviated as 0 0.001, or 10 to the minus 3 meters. I should put the M there. Okay. Now, the next size that we could talk about is called a micrometer or micrometer. Okay. Some people say micrometer, but that usually talks about the instrument you use it, or micrometer. This is abbreviated with a mu, or this funky looking symbol, and an M. And that is one millionth of a meter. And it is abbreviated as 0 0.000001, or 10 to the minus six meters, okay? I have six places behind the decimal, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, when we talk about micrometers or micrometers, that's what we're talking about, something that is one million. So look, if I take a meter stick and I divide it into a hundred smaller units, then I would have a centimeter. If I divide it into a thousand smaller units that are of equal size, then I would have millimeters. If I took one of those millimeters and divided it into a thousand smaller units, or this thing into a million little pieces, that were of equal size, then I would have micrometers or micrometers. One more size that we're gonna talk about in this class is going to be called a nanometer. You hear about nanotechnology, it means the technology of things that are very, very, very tiny. It is abbreviated NM, and it is one, there's a thousand million billionth of a meter, and it's, designated as 0 0.000000001, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10 to the minus 9 meters. So now, if I can take this meter stick and divide it into a billion smaller slices of equal size, then I would have nanometers. Or if you took a millimeter on a ruler and you divided it into a, a thousand smaller size, you'd have a micrometer. If you took one of those one thousandths of a millimeter and divided it by another thousand, then I would have a nanometer. And then we can talk about picometers and femtometers, and we're not going to get into that. And some of the organisms that we're going to look at are going to be in the range of micrometers or micrometers and nanometers. So I want you to understand this terminology. When I talk about a meter, centimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and nanometer, I want you to know we're talking about a hundredth of a meter, thousandth of a meter, a millionth of a meter, or a billionth of a meter, and you need to know their designations, okay, using um, the superscripts, okay, or the exponent. So, know the abbreviation, know what the fraction size would be, know the decimal, and then know the um, exponential way of writing each one of these. I may ask a few questions about this if you're in my class. So, it's important that you know those terms. All right, so now let's get rid of this, and we're gonna move on to some definitions that we need to understand when we're doing microscopy, okay? So, um, we'll make sure I follow the notes in the correct order that they're written, so I may step off screen and view up my notes for just a second, because I wanna do the definitions in the order that I've written them. Now, um, one of the first terms we can talk about is called resolution. Resolution is one of those terms that can have multiple meanings. We can resolve to do something and have New Year's resolution. This is totally different, okay? So resolution is the ability, if I could spell right, to distinguish two or more objects as distinct entities. Now this is kind of a technical definition, 
But when we're looking at things under a microscope, or anytime we're looking at something, we're going to look at the resolving power or the resolution. And we want to be able to see two things as two distinct entities. For example, I'm going to put two dots on the board here. The resolution at the magnification that we're looking at is not very good. I mean, it's decent. I can see that there's a very distinct line between them separating them. Now imagine if we magnified this, then what we might see is these two dots get bigger and we can see that the space between them is also very distinct. Then we have good resolution. But if I magnify something and it becomes so blurry through the magnification, like putting your fingers up against your nose and you can't see the, the difference between your fingers, then we have lost resolving power or lost res resolution. They don't look like two distinct entities. So if you look at something from so far away, you may not be able to see that there's two different things there. They're just kind of jammed together. As you get closer, you see them as two separate things. And then as you get too close, they actually start to come together. And that's something you can do. If you put your hands very close to each other, but leave a gap, you can bring them nearer and nearer to your face, but when they get so close, it almost looks like your fingers are crossing each other, you lose resolution. This is why all increasing magnification does not always provide the best view of an object, okay? Um, another definition that we should talk about is called refraction. So, Refraction can be defined a couple of ways. One is a change in the direction of a ray of light as it passes from one medium into another or to another. When light is shot out of a light source, so if I had a little light bulb here shooting bundles of energy out called photons of light, there's, um, Einstein came up with what they call the dual nature of light. Is light a particle or is it a wave? And it turns out that it's a little bit of both. So light is shot out of these little bundles of energy that we call a photon. The photons don't travel exactly in a straight line, they travel in a wave pattern and this is where we get the term wavelength, which would be the distance between two waves. We're not going to talk about that in great detail. But it, if I average out the distance between the peak and the, and the bottom of the wave, it turns out that this photon is going to travel in a particular direction. It's just traveling in a waveform in this direction. The direction would be called the ray of light. So when light is shot out of a light source, whatever medium the photon is traveling in, the ray of light is passing through, let's say it's passing through air, is going to be, it's going to have a particular direction. Now, imagine this, okay? Let me erase this definition because it's in my way, but I want to show you something. So now, I also have on a, a table some glass with some water in it. And as this ray of light hits the glass, it will bend a little, and then it will bend again, and then it will bend again, and it will continue to bend, so that my eyeball, when I see it, makes it appear as if it came from a different location. This is why when you stand up in a swimming pool, your legs look shorter, because the light coming from your legs is hitting the surface of the water, and then refracting when it hits the air, and it's making your feet look like they're coming from a different distance, okay? So this change in direction of the light as it passes from air to glass, from glass to water, from water to air, from, or however it passes through, will cause the light to bend and appear as if it came from a different point than it was actually released. And we call that refraction. Some people also call refraction the bending of light. Now, the technical definition is it's a change in the direction of a ray of light as it passes from one medium to another, or it's the bending of the light. How much is it bent? Okay. We could talk about the refractive index of something. Since we know what refraction is, 
And we've defined refraction as a change in the direction of a ray of light as it passes from one medium to another. Then we can also define what's called the refractive index. The refract refractive index is the measurement of the bending of light. of a particular substance. So some early physicists came along and were interested in how much could light be bent by this substance or that substance, by glass, by water, and by other things. And this is an important concept to us because when we use a microscope, we're looking through lenses. And usually it's glass lenses, and those glass lenses are going to refract the light or bend it. That's what actually makes it look bigger to our eyes. And so um, sometimes we need to know what the refractive index of a substance is so that we can um, take advantage of its refractive properties. Now, one of the things I'm going to show you real quick, so I'm going to erase this. You should have these definitions for refraction and refractive index down, the measurement of the bending of light of a particular substance. When I talk about the refractive index of something, that means how much does the light bend? Okay, now, when light is bent and it's passing through some of our lenses, sometimes the light is, um, we're not going to capture the light in a way that allows us to see great detail because as it passes from a glass slide, for example, we're shooting light from what's called the condenser in your microscope. The condenser is something that's going to catch the light. It has a little lens. So on your microscope, you're going to have a light bulb at the bottom. That light is going to be shot out in an infinite number of directions. Some of the light is going to enter the condenser. What the condenser does is all the light that's captured in here gets bent and focused to the same point. It has a little lens. It's going to refract the light. And that point where it's all going to meet, hopefully, is under your glass slip where whatever you want to see is. I tend to think of light as little BBs shot out of a shotgun. If I hung a thread from the ceiling down here and I fired a shotgun from the back of the room, how many of the BBs would hit the thread? How many photons of light are going to hit such a tiny little object when we shoot light at it in order to see it? Because our eyes the, the photoreceptors in our eyes are called photoreceptors because they receive photons of light, which triggers the visual pathway. Now, what if I could take a giant metal funnel and funnel all those BBs from the shotgun to where I guarantee a bunch of them are going to hit the thread? That's essentially what a condenser does, is it funnels the light down onto the little tiny object so that we guarantee enough light is hitting it that as it hits it, it starts to spread out and refract. Well, sometimes that light is refracted so much that when we use our objective lens, and there's a little tiny lens and a piece of our microscope called the objective, sometimes that lens is not going to catch enough light as it's refractive out, refracted out for us to see. So we can put a drop of oil in here, and the oil will also help refract the light and keep it in our, sort of in our, pathway of viewing through the microscope. And we're going to use an oil immersion lens in, in, in microbiology in order to see some little tiny objects. The, the, the greater the magnification of the objective, the smaller this lens has to be for, to get the curvature of the glass right to get massive magnification. So as we go up in magnification to a really high power magnification, to the objective that we call the high power objective on your microscope. We're going to need to put a drop of oil on the slide and then move the, the objective in. And we know what the refractive properties of that oil is. The type of oil that's used in oil immersion has the same refractive properties as glass. And therefore, um, it will aid us in, in visualizing little tiny objects through a high power objective. I hope that makes sense to you. It's a little hard to explain in common language, but that's why we need to know what the refractive index is of certain substances. We might be able to take advantage of that. Um, another one of the defini definitions we can talk about is magnification. Well, that's an easy one. 
Um, to magnify something makes, means to make it appear larger, but magnification is simply that. Um, let me look at the, def the technical definition before I put it in my own words, but um, magnification is usually defined as the increase in size of an object for viewing. So when I talk about the magnification, I'm talking about how much bigger are we making it appear than it is. So if I look at a little dot here, and then I have a lens, and as the light spreads out here, it makes that dot look 10 times bigger, then I can say that this lens has a 10x magnification. It's going to make this dot appear 10 times bigger than it really is. That's not really 10, it's probably 1,000x, but anyway, um, or 100x. But nonetheless, when we talk about magnification, we're talking about the increase in size of an object for viewing, or as we view it. And that's all that we mean by magnification, okay? Now, um, we also need to talk about what's called the numerical aperture. So the numerical aperture is essentially um, the measurement of the amount of light that is being captured um, by a particular lens. So we define it as the measurement of the amount of light captured by a lens. And sometimes we can think of the aperture as what is the size of the hole that we're looking through? So when I look through a microscope, one of the things that I, we're going to be using in our classes or we're going to be using a, a compound light microscope. And I'm going to go through these definitions again when we go through the types of microscopy, but a light microscope simply uses visible light from, like from a light bulb in order to view something. When we talk about a compound light microscope, then what we're talking about is a series of lenses, and the lenses compound the magnification or increase it even more. So essentially, a real simple idea is this. When you look through your microscope, there's a little tube you're gonna look through at the top called the ocular. And the ocular lens is the lens that's here. And it's gonna have a certain magnification, usually they're four times magnification. And what that means is, is if you put your eyeball here, then whatever's on the other side of this lens is going to appear four times bigger than it really is. And this lens will magnify it. It'll have that kind of magnification. Now, that lens is actually ref is taking light that's reflected off a mirror that comes from your objective lens or the objective. And the objective are going to be the little metal tubes that you rotate in and out. And those objectives are usually going to have a number on them. They'll say something like 10x, 40x, or 100x on our microscopes. And essentially what this means, let me make sure we're still within the field of view of my camera. We are right on the edge. So I'm going to change my camera over just a little bit. I'm sorry for that odd glitch. Now, there's a little lens in the objective here that's also going to magnify an object either 10 times, 40 times, or 100 times, depending on which objective that you use. We tend to refer to this one as the um, scanning objective. And actually, yeah. The scanning objective is very low magnification, but it's going to have a large field of view so we can see and we can scan around and find something first, and then we can zoom in. As we increase magnification, the field of view gets smaller and the numerical aperture gets smaller. And as the numerical aperture gets smaller, that means a lot of the light is being blocked and less light is coming through. So when we talk about the numerical aperture, we're talking about how much light is being allowed to be passed through that lens. And it really is sort of, an, an idea would be like the field of view. And the greater the magnification, the smaller the numerical aperture. And very often that makes the field look darker. That's why on your microscope, you can adjust the amount of light. As we increase magnification, the aperture goes down. The lower the aperture, the less light is allowed through, the brighter we have to make our scope. Now what's going to happen is 
you're going to have some specimen on a slide that you're trying to see. The condenser is going to focus light onto that spot. The light will scatter. The objective will take that light and it will focus it and it will crisscross and it will appear on this mirror. I'm not drawing straight lines, but and then these this light is going to get crisscross and appear on your eyeball. And whatever object, whatever magnification this is, I'm going to make an object appear 10 times bigger here. And this is going to take that one that's already 10 times magnified and increase the magnification four more times. And this objective is going to have a little hole with a piece of glass stuck in it. That's going to be the numerical aperture. And that's going to tell you how much light is entering through that objective. And that's essentially how a, micro, a compound microscope works, is we shoot light. Most of that light's going to miss the little tiny object, so the condenser, which is down here, will condense the light or focus it on the object. And we're going to have to learn how to focus the condenser for maximum resolution. And then the light will hit the objective. The numerical aperture will allow a certain amount of light in it, so we may have to adjust our light in order to see the object. And then as it goes through the objective lens, it's gonna magnify it a certain amount. It will reflect off a mirror, pass through an ocular lens, and that will magnify it even more so that we can begin to see the object in great detail. And then we have to focus it and get everything else right. So, that's kind of a basic idea of what we're talking about. Now, another definition, a couple of more definitions that we need to go over. One of them is the working distance. We're never really gonna measure the working distance, but it's an important concept in our class, especially for students who are first learning to use microscopes. The working distance is the distance between the tip of the objective and the object to be viewed. It's the distance between the objective and whatever we're looking at. And what you're going to be looking at is usually going to be on a slide with a little cover slip over it. And so the distance from the end of the objective to the slide, that distance would be called our working distance. That's how much room we have to work in order to see something. Now one of the things you're going to learn when we do this microscopy in lab is the lower power of the objective the greater the working distance. When I switch from the 10x to the 40x objective, the objective is longer and the working distance goes down. When I go to the 100x objective, it's gonna get, it's gonna look like it's kissing the slide. It's gonna be very, very, very close. And so as we increase magnification, the aperture gets smaller and so does the working distance. This is why we will have to adjust our light when we go up in magnification. It's also why you only use the fine focus knob once you switch objectives, which is going to lead us to our next definition. Okay, so I'm going to erase a lot of this. And we're going to continue with a couple of more definitions. And then we'll move on to some other ideas. Okay. And I know that's a really crude, rough, dirty drawing over there. But you know, it's the best we can do and I would love to show you some fixed images and sometimes they help but you can look those up one of the things that I know being a neurobiologist by training is and having worked in memory and learning of the brain is that when we see an image unfolding before our eyes we tend to memorize it or see much more greater detail and process it at higher levels of memory and learning than when we just see a completed image okay so that's why I'm kind of old school and draw this stuff out so one of the terms I want to use is this, parfocal. The microscopes, the compound microscopes that we're going to use in our lab are said to be parfocal. And parfocal simply means equal focus. Essentially what that means is there's a thing called the focal distance and the focal point, and we could get into so many terms here and get into a lot of physics, but essentially what it means is this. I'm going to have three different objectives that I'm going to be looking at. 
are using on my microscopes. We're going to have what's called the scanning objective. The scanning objective is going to have uh, the ability to magnify things 10 times. We're going to have the low power objective, which we're going to do this. Well, our objective has the ability to magnify things 40 times. And then we're going to have what we call the high power objective or the high dry. And it can do up to 100 times magnification. Okay. Now, when I change the, the positioning of the lens, it could change how well things appear in focus and how much we can focus and resolve something. It's almost like if you use a, a 35 millimeter camera, or if I were to take three different telescopes that have the ability to see at different distances, but I'm looking at, at the same object from the same distance. Through some of these, it might appear blurry. Our microscopes are actually designed so that all three of these are gonna focus light to the same distance. That's why they're said to be par focal. And that distance is going to be where this mirror is so that when it hits our eye, it doesn't matter which objective we're using, they're almost perfectly in focus. So what you're going to notice when you use your microscope and you're looking through the oculars, is that if you're on the low power objective or the scanning objective, when you switch to the high power objective and you click it in and you look through there, it's gonna be almost perfectly in focus, almost perfect. It could be a hair off, which is why we have the fine focus knob on the microscope. You only use the coarse focusing knob when we're on the scanning objective. Once we switch to higher power objectives, we're gonna get so close to the slide that you're, and it's gonna be par focal or perfectly in focused almost, that you barely have to turn the fine focus knob to make very minute adjustments. If you were to grab the coarse focus knob and turn it the wrong direction, you're gonna jam the slide into that objective and those objectives are the most expensive part of the microscope. So we don't wanna do that. So it's important for you to know that your microscopes are par focal, meaning all three objectives are gonna have equal focus or pretty close to it, and then we just have to do a very fine adjustment. You never, ever, ever wanna to touch the coarse focusing knob once you're above the scanning objective. That's the way our microscopes are designed, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> one last thing I want to talk about. Uh, I want to make sure I covered all the information I wanted to cover. Well, the last concept that we need to talk about before we move on to some of these other definitions is total magnification. What is the total magnification of an object? And it's important to know the total magnification so that we can try to get an idea of what the size of something really is once it's been magnified. And so the total magnification is usually what we look at the ocular magnification. I'm just gonna put ocular mag for magnification. I don't wanna write magnification out over and over. It's the ocular magnification times the objective magnification, okay? So, I'm gonna have an ocular lens that I'm gonna look through. And that ocular lens is usually fixed at 4X or some are set at 10X, okay? Now, I'm gonna have different objectives. Our scanning one we said before is gonna be 10X. Then we have another one that's going to be 40x, and then another objective that's going to be 100x. Okay. If I know how much this is going to magnify something, and an object that is here, once magnified through this objective, will appear 10 times larger, 40 times larger, or 100 times larger, and then I'm going to magnify it through this, and this is going to take it and magnify it four times more, then I simply multiply the um, magnification of the ocular times the magnification of the objective. Four times 10, this is really gonna make things appear 40 times to our eye. Four times 40, oh, that's not right. Yeah, 
Anyway, these are the incorrect numbers, and I just realized that, but that's okay. Um, we can make something look 160 times larger, or we can make something look 400 times larger. And I did this incorrectly. I used the wrong numbers, but that's okay. We could figure out what the total magnification of anything is by multiplying the ocular times the objective magnification and get the total magnification, okay? So, so when we get to our lab, we're gonna look at uh, some of our magnification. And essentially what I did was I inverted these two numbers. Usually your ocular is gonna be 10x. So if we redid this exercise here, this is going to be 10x. This is going to be 4x as our scanning objective. We're going to have 10x, and then we're going to have 40x here. So when I do the magnification, I'm going to get 40, I'm going to get 100, and I'm going to get 400 magnification. Okay? That's how our microscopes are set up. I simply just inverted these two numbers, and I'm not going to go back and start this video over. Okay? So. I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. My apologies for the confusion. Now, um, once we're, we've mastered all these definitions, and by the way, I'm just gonna tell you guys, there's gonna be a ton of information, just like in anatomy and physiology and chemistry, microbiology has a ton of information. You cannot learn all this information in a giant chunk. You have to break it in smaller chunks. So take a few definitions or a few concepts and only learn those as if they're the only thing in the world you have to learn. Add a little bit more, then go back and review, then add a little bit more. And when I say add, what I mean is you study that as if it's the only thing you have to make, take a test on, and you do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. You should be able to list these words in order and then define them from memory without looking at your notes. That's the only way to master this material, okay? So now, we have a bunch of definitions that we've, we've gotten down. We've talked about um, uh, microscopy. What is microscopy? The technique of observing little things by magnifying them with lenses. We talked about magnification. We talked about resolution. We talked about refraction. We've talked about total magnification. Um, talked about parfocal and uh, the numerical aperture. I think those are the definitions that you really need to pay attention to and really understand. Um, oh, and also working distance. Now, we're also going to talk about, excuse me for a second, I need to take a drink. My throat gets dry as I'm talking. We're gonna talk about the types of microscopy that we can use in order to observe things. There's different types of microscopes and there's different microscopic techniques. So. Uh, one of the simple types of microscopy that we can talk about is light microscopy. So for light microscopy, it simply uses visible light to magnify an, an image. So it's using a light bulb or a visible light, light that we can see with our eyeballs. Now, we're going to talk, we're going to use the microscope called compound light microscopy. And this uses visible light magnified through a series of lenses. And the magnification of one lens is compounded by the magnification of the next lens. And if we increase the number of lenses, we can increase the magnifying power to some degree. So that's all that that means, okay? There's another one called dark field microscopy. And I'm not gonna write the term microscopy out. I'm just gonna abbreviate it for now because it's in your notes. For those of you who are enrolled in my class and you purchase a note set, then the terms are already listed in order. Now, dark field microscopy, when it comes to this, is essentially, um, we use, this uses light 
at a low angle to make the background appear darker or appear dark. It's essentially as if you were looking at something in the field, what if the field were dark and the image you want to see is light, then it would appear as contrast against a dark background. And we take the light and instead of having it shine from the bottom through the image, you put the light at a very low angle off to the side and the way that the light comes across is it makes the background look dark and then some of the light is, is refracted or some of the light bounces off the image into your lens and then you can see it, okay? Um, another type of microscopy is called phase contrast, okay? And if you're gonna look at something that's transparent, then you really need to see a lot of contrast between the edges of a transparent image in order to visualize it or see it, okay? So a lot of the things we're gonna look at really don't have any color to them. We're also gonna talk about staining, adding color so that we can see it. But in phase contrast microscopy, um, it basically is a technique to visualize transparent objects or a transparent specimen. We'll use object or specimen sometimes when we're talking about what we want to see. Um, for example, if you wanted to look at living cells, when we stain things to see them, very often the stains will damage the cells or kill the cells. We're going to talk about fixation. Fixation means that you make everything fixed or still. Usually hit heat fixation. We put some stuff on a slide and smear it, and then we heat it up, and it makes it stick to the slide. It also kills what you want to see. But if you wanted to see something that's alive, and you needed to see it, you wouldn't be able to stain it all the time. So we could use phase contrast, and the phase contrast technique basically allows us to see living organisms um, by, in, by creating a contrast between the edges of the organism and all the background um, so that things that are not stained, things that are transparent, can be viewed without using any kind of staining techniques. Okay? Um, it also allows us to look at certain things that are growing in culture because in culture they're still alive. Um, now, there's another type of microscopy that is called um, fluorescent microscopy. And fluorescence microscopy essentially what we do is we cause we cause a type of radiation to occur called fluorescence. And there's different types of radiation. One's called fluorescence and one's called phosphorescence. And we're not going to talk about uh, phosphorescence. But in fluorescence microscopy, what we do is we use ultraviolet light or what we call UV light. My U's and my V's very often can look similar. I apologize to excite electrons in the specimen to emit fluorescent light. So there's a, now this can get really, really technical. And, um, um, and by the way, we, we usually use some some kind of dye for this, okay? You have to dye or stain the material. A stain is something that sticks to it. A dye can stick to it, but in a different way, and we're not gonna get into that level of detail, but um, there are molecules called chromophores. We're gonna define them in a little bit, but the chromophore is whatever is going to emit the color that we wanna see in the, in the um, specimen. A lot of specimens, cannot be seen because there's no color contrast to them. And we talked about phase contrast. 
but not a lot of detail can be seen sometimes in certain specimens. So sometimes we have to stain or dye the specimen to see the contrast or to see them. And in fluorescent microscopy, we use a dye that has kind of what we call loose electrons. And that's, I know that's not a very technical term, and some of y'all are gonna probably get on me if you know a whole lot about this, but that's okay. I'm trying to explain this to sophomore level students who don't have a lot of the vocabulary or the physics sometimes to understand what I'm talking about. And that's not meant to be an insult. You're learning this material as you go. So what happens is we take some kind of dye and we dye the material that we wanna see. And we take very high energy light, ultraviolet light, and it's gonna bombard the electron or bombard the atoms in that dye with this high energy. And if you remember anything from our um, discussion on atoms, we usually have the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus, and then we have the electrons whizzing around out here in electron shells. If we were to do an electron diagram, there's so many electrons out of the outer orbital, for example. Now, <coughs> there's only so many electrons that can fit in an orbital, and we did the 288 rule. Now, we can change that, but it really takes a lot of extra influence to, to do this, a lot of energy. And so if I take some UV light on a particular type of atom that's in a dye, and I hit these electrons with it, the electrons can get kicked up to the next energy level and whiz around the, uh, the atom in a new energy level, a higher energy level. And eventually they're gonna fall right back down. And as they fall back to their original orbital, they give off some, type of, some new radiation, a new type of light that we call fluorescent light. And so using UV radiation to kick electrons up, excite electrons in a dye, that causes them to emit fluorescent light is called fluorescence microscopy, okay? That's all that it really means. Um, and in fluorescence, what happens is as the electrons get kicked up, they immediately fall down. We kick the next one up, it falls, the next one up, and they're doing this in real time. If I shut off the light, the fluorescence goes away. The difference between that and phosphorescence is in phosphorescence, the UV light kicks the electrons up, and when we turn the light off, they fall much more slowly over time and as all those electrons and all those atoms are falling, it will continue to glow in the dark, so to speak. So if you ever got a little glow in the dark toy that you have to hold up to a light, and then you turn the lights off and it glows for a while and disappears, that's phosphorescence. We're not talking about that. Fluorescence is exciting electrons using ultraviolet light, and they immediately fall back down and give off fluorescent light. That's essentially what it means, okay? So that's one of the electron microscopy, or one, not electron, one of the microscopic techniques that we're going to use is fluorescence. And we're not gonna use them in our lab, but they are used. I used to work on a fluorescent confocal microscope in graduate school, and we got to see some really, really cool things, okay? So that's fluorescence microscopy. Okay? Using ultraviolet light to excite electrons in a dye so that we can see an image. Another type of microscopy is called confocal microscopy. Con means with, especially if you speak Spanish, like chili con carne means chili with meat. So confocal means to focus with. Now in confocal microscopy, this utilizes a computer. To scan a specimen at different depths. and reassemble the image into 3D. Now that's not really the technical definition of confocal microscopy, and I'm gonna read you what confocal microscopy is supposed to be, but basically it's using a computer to make, well, it's, I guess that is the definition, but it's using a computer to scan an, an, a specimen at different depths. So now look, if I have a really thick specimen here, and my objective is only going to focus on a particular depth, everything in this plane is the, called the focal plane. Everything in that plane would be in focus if I moved it around. But anything here or here would appear blurry 
because it's not at the right depth. In confocal microscopy, we can scan and scan and scan and scan at different depths, and then the computer takes all those little focused images and restacks them so that we can see something in three dimensions. It's allow it allows us to have a three-dimensional view of or focus at many different depths using a confocal microscope. That's all that that is. And we use a confocal fluorescent microscope at one point to image, to get a complete image of some three-dimensional neurons. It was really interesting, really cool stuff. Um, Electron microscopy is another type of technique that we can talk about, and there's different types of electron microscopy. Um, when you use an electron microscope, which I also was able to do in graduate school, I actually took an entire class on electron microscopy, and it was the coolest class. Very difficult, but it was a really cool class, and we got to see some interesting things. Um, in electron microscopy, basically what this does is it uses a beam of what we call accelerated electrons to magnify an image. Okay? So, now I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible because this is a, you know, one of the hardest things about teaching here, sorry, let me take a drink. My voice gets very rough as I'm talking through all these videos, so <clears throat> I take in some hot coffee or hot tea sometimes to soothe my throat. So when we're looking at an object, and let me just say this, one, one of the difficult things about teaching is knowing when to cut off because I could talk for three days on microscopy alone. But essentially, when we're looking at an image, different wavelengths of light. So I told you before, photons of light travel in a wave-like pattern, and I can measure the distance between any two waves of a particular photon, and they should all be the same distance. And we refer to this as the wavelength. And not all photons travel at the same wavelength. Some photons have a much smaller wavelength. And when we measure the distance of these waves, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy of the photon. And it's almost like um, if I had something here that I wanted to see, and let's say the photons are passing over it, they would miss it and not hit it. I wouldn't be able to visualize that image. But another wavelength photon is so small that it can't help but hit this and allow me to see it. Some objects are so tiny that a lot of the light that we're going to use, both visible light and ultraviolet light, may not allow us to visualize the image. But electrons are traveling, and they're such tiny little bundles of energy that electrons are going to hit it no matter what in an electron beam. And when I accelerate them, I'm just making them travel really, really, really fast with a series of magnets. And I'm going to leave it at that. But that's what electron microscopy does, is it uses um, uh, an accelerated beam of electrons which have such tiny wavelengths that they can actually hit objects that are much smaller and allow us to visualize those objects than photons of light, okay? Now there's different types of electron microscopes. That's all you need to know about electron microscopy, really. I'm trying to get the concept out there so that your brain can wrap around it. You need to know the definitions. I'm really not interested in students just memorizing definitions, though. I want you to try to be able to understand what the words mean and what they're trying to say. A couple of types of electron microscopy. One is called transmission electron microscopy. And essentially, transmission electron microscopy will um, fire electrons through a specimen. The specimen has to be specially prepared, it has to be extremely thin, and there's a whole preparation process but essentially it's going to fire them through a specimen in order to form an image. Um, almost like a light microscope. We're firing from the, from the light source through the condenser, through the specimen. So electron microscopes that do transmission electron microscopy will literally have something that's firing electrons from it. And those electrons are going to pass through a very thin specimen and then be collected and formed into an image. 
And because the electrons have such small wavelengths, way smaller than photons of light, they allow us to see little tiny things that light will not allow us to see. Now, in what we call a scanning electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope, and I keep misspelling the word microscope, essentially scans the surface. It uses a beam of electrons to scan the surface of an object. So what happens in a scanning electron microscope is let's say I'm looking at some little tiny object and I want to see all the surface markings of this object. Essentially what it's going to do is it's going to fire from a, a, a special um, material all these electrons in a beam and then this beam is going to be focused and as it travels over the surface of the image, it's going to reflect back what we call secondary electrons. It's going to cause the electrons in whatever atoms are on the surface of this to fire off. And then we will collect those electrons and use a computer to, re, um, to, to form an image based on the firing pattern of these secondary electrons. So in scanning electron microscopy, it uses a beam of electrons to scan the surface of an image. Or the surface of an object. And cause it to emit what we call secondary electrons. from its surface. And those electrons can be gathered by a special device and then using a computer can reassemble all that into an image. Okay. Um, the detector that's going to pick up those electrons will provide some information that the <coughs> excuse me, a computer program We'll take and reassemble that so that we can actually visualize the surface of whatever it is that we're looking at. It gives us a really, really, really cool image of some things that are very difficult to see. Okay, so um, there are a few other types of microscopy that we could talk about, and we're not even going to use a lot of this microscopy in our class. But I do think that you need to be aware of the types of microscopy that can be used in microbiology, and if you continue on and do research in microbiology one day, then you would be using a lot of these microscopic techniques. I'm not gonna talk about any of the other techniques. There's a few more we could, but I'm not gonna talk about them now, okay? So. Well, we're approaching an hour on this lecture, and um, I don't wanna continue the lecture too long because students will start to fade out, so I'm gonna end this lecture now. We'll continue our lecture on microscopy in the next video. I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did. And um, thank you for watching. I'll see you on the flip side in the next video.